It is officially late November, and I'm finally back to making a full-length video for the first time since late July. I'm not sticking so much to the goals for Anime Boston next year and the 500 sub goal for this year because I know I went MIA for a while and haven't been able to bring full-form content like this for the better part of a third of a year. Obviously, your support of my shorts since has been tremendous, and I love you guys so much for that. This last half a year has been the most chaotic period in my life. Finally, this is going to be insane to edit. This script is literally 12 pages long, so give this video some love. Alright, let's get on to why you're here. To find out if the Darling in the Franks ending, or anime as a whole, was really as bad as we all thought it was. And hit subscribe. Okay, maybe just the Darling in the Franks stuff. Fair warning, this is going to be a long video, so grab some popcorn and prepare to do nothing for probably close to 20 minutes. Let's start with the basics. This anime is very dystopian, with a hearty mixture of post-apocalyptic themes. The character dynamics are some of the best I've seen, though, and I can confidently say this after doing a full rewatch over the past week or so, the anime focuses on these children called Parasites, and they pilot large robots called Franks. These Franks are used as weapons to defend against Klaxosaurs, which are drawn to the magma energy used by the plantations. The battles are ruthless at times and bring out some of the best, and worst, in the children, but there's no definitive answer as to when these fights stop. Everything changes when the hero, the main protagonist, meets a girl, Zero Two, and discovers that he can pilot a Franks despite not being able to with anyone else. However, this fateful encounter ends up being the one thing that turns the entire world upside down. Early on, we find a lot of disdain for Hiro. It's really pretty uncalled for considering he works harder than literally anyone else to pilot a Franks and is the one who gave them all names when they were little. This is where the character dynamics begin to show, and when I say everyone has a vastly distinct personality compared to the person next to them, I mean it. For starters, Ichigo is very egotistical and her primary focus is on Hiro, even as she's given command of Squad 13. Goro is the most level-headed and the voice of reason in a field of chaotic rumblings. Miku is your typical tsundere who gets annoyed when something goes wrong, but she does her best to console the other female members of the squad when they need it. Futoshi is perhaps the most emotional of the boys, but he wears his heart on his sleeve and isn't afraid of his feelings for Kokoro. Kokoro is the most soft-spoken of the group and is relatively unsure of what her role or purpose should be in the squad. However, she comes face to face with long-forgotten feelings during her time with Mitsuru. Mitsuru comes off as a bit of a jerk at times and doesn't portray much emotion. He has a very cocky attitude throughout much of the first half of the anime, but he cools off in a startling second half. Ikuno doesn't have an overbearing role, such as some others, but she's the most level-headed of the pistols. However, she's perhaps the most mysterious of the plantation's children. Zorobe is rambunctious and always full of energy. He never thinks things through and constantly fights with Miku, but he's always positive. He sees the good in almost everything. Finally, we have Hiro who's unsure of his role in everything and is constantly attacked early on by key members of Squad 13. However, he develops a bond with Zero Two that transcends literally both Earth and outer space. He longs to be useful, but he's also determined to keep a promise he made many years ago. I could spend all day on characters, but I'll be touching on them more as we go throughout the rest of the video, Zero Two and Hiro especially. Nana and Hachi I don't have much to say on, but we'll get there when we get there, the Nines included. Let's talk about Zero Two now. She's ambitious in hell and won't take no for an answer. She's stubborn, but she's faithful. Throughout much of the first half of the anime, she's playful and happy to call Hiro her darling. But it's when she retreats back into herself after Hiro was pulled from piloting Strelitzia that she becomes almost inhuman. It's the special relationship the two have formed that causes Zero Two to remember how they were once treated long ago, in the snowy forest and all of the tests she had to undergo. Her heart is in the right place, and you could say she's almost overprotective of Hiro, especially once she learns that it was him she made the promise to never leave the side up when she was young. Call her crazy and emotional at times, but it's that very irrational craze that commands much of the anime itself. And we'll get into that a little later as well. I have frequently talked about the idea of humanity and what it means to be human, both of which are highly subjective. Check out my VV Florida song video from last December and my Expelled from Paradise video from May. The viewer is left to determine for themselves whether or not they think Zero Two is human and what their interpretation of the word is. While she may appeal to many early on with her commanding nature and playful spirit, she has enormous disregard for much of Squad 13, even after being reassigned. Is it that she only cares about herself in this case? We know that in order to be human, she must kill Klaxosaurs. 
yet there was never any definitive proof whether this ended up being true or not. Her human-like appearance suggests as much, but the anime unfortunately fails to expand upon this, so her rampages look like nothing more than temper tantrums. So why? Why the focus on being human? Again, the anime loses points here, not because of a lack of reasoning, but because that reasoning is barely deeper than surface level. We understand that Zero Two wants to be human, but we don't understand why she wants to be human. It's not well explained, but this will be something we revisit in a bit as I would like to move on. What I find interesting is this idea of Papa and how he will provide all that is needed. No one questions this until shit hits the fan and it's revealed that the apes were all just deployed to try and merge humanity and the Klaxus horse with Firm. First of all, this is strange for two reasons. One, nobody questions Papa's authority, but nobody actually knows whether he's real or just the personification of an idea. Two, with Papa being part of the apes and achieving immortality, what reason does he have to play such a central role in all of the children's lives? There's nothing to gain other than instilling the idea of a false prophet or god, in some cases, to keep everyone in check, but at the same time, these are children we're talking about here. The adults have all gone underground and forgotten about the children entirely. They do not have responsibility. This forces the fighting onto the children, and many die fighting the Klaxosaurs who were never really the enemy to begin with. This affirms my second reason. The children put blind faith in this Papa figure, and never question his authority as he's supposed to be this omniscient, centralized figure. The first seeds of doubt get planted when Zordame gets left behind in the underground city, and encounters the adult woman who explains the situation between her and her partner, the man hooked up to a machine to receive pleasure. Zorame being Zorame asks too many questions and eventually wears the woman out before she calls so he can be returned to the plantation. But not before he asks if she'll be his friend when he becomes an adult. The answer is a simple no, but this leaves a large hole that never gets filled. What was this encounter really about, and why was it Zorame that the story chose to leave behind? The idea of friendship is peculiar as he even mentions the fights he has with Miku, to which it's suggested he could try switching partners. There remains a lot of uncertainty about the whole thing to which Zorname ultimately decides to stick with Miku, but if there eventually comes a day when they no longer have to pilot a Franks, when does that day come and how do they get there? This question comes up again towards the end after Kokoro and Mitsuru's memories are altered, but it never receives a direct answer, and neither does the process of aging. If Papa knew that it was a fruitless effort to try to clamp down on questions and taming Zero Two was impossible, then... Was this more of an effort to advance character dynamics and not the overall story because, as it stands, the alteration of Kokoro and Mitsuru's memories had no real impact on the main story in the beginning? Obviously, Kokoro's desire to have children was a tremendous driving force in starting over from scratch after Plantation 13 was abandoned for a month. While I'm still on the topic, why was Zorobe's number 666? In Christian mythology, this is the Mark of the Beast, or Lucifer. This mark, according to the Book of Revelations, is taken up by those who value personal safety over fidelity to Christ. Those who are either afraid in the end times or have removed Christ from their lives. This is the mark of humanity, not as an adjective, but a noun. The number also represents man and the perfection of humanity, but this doesn't explain why Zordame is 666. It is perhaps because he's so arrogant and when he fell from the grace of Papa, could it be that Papa was, in theory, a false god? Was Zordame's devotion to Papa for much of the anime a symbol of Papa's faults and sins? The only other thing I want to mention about this goes back to the idea of human perfection. Perfection in of itself is subjective. Think about how you use the word to describe something you're pleased with or really enjoy. Was Zordame's fall from Papa the final piece to the puzzle that the survivors of Plantation 13 needed to start over and create a world they deemed as perfect? It's reasonable to think that this version of 666 doesn't represent the Mark of the Beast or anything related to the Devil, but instead the subjective nature of perfection. One final thing that never gets clarified is when the woman is cut off saying, After all, you are... You are what? There could be many answers to this, but I'll let you guys think on that one given what I've already gone over. As we move on here, we come to the idea of trust, also subjective and very dependent on the individual. If you can't trust your partner and fail to understand each other, you can't pilot the Franks, which leads to a breakdown of relations, not just among your partner, but the entire plantation, and this is evident in episode 11. Episode 13 begins to expand on this with questions of the self and understanding one's own personality. This leads to the questioning of the entire idea of the plantations and eventually Papa himself, but more importantly it opens the door to questioning, explicitly of the adults. 
There are Nana and Hachi, as well as the Doctor, but the only other adults that make a major appearance in the anime is the woman whose Rodame meets in the city. Why are there so few adults, and why did Nana and Hachi end up taking over operations for Plantation 13? Who are the adults? I don't have a solid explanation for this, but recall the infusion of yellow blood cells into the children, to make them more compatible pilots for the Franks. This is done in earnest as the anime enters the final few episodes, the side effects being an accelerated aging process. To combat some of this stress, including piloting of the Franks, the children are given an elixir of heavily concentrated yellow blood cells. This brings us back to the aging process. The apes forewent aging a long time ago, according to Dr. Franks. Dr. Franks, however, decided to age as normal. We know many finally decided to halt their own aging processes, but if that were the case, and infertility eventually took hold, why wasn't the same anti-aging serum given to anyone else? This is where the anime seems to contradict itself. If infertility is as serious a problem as the anime made it out to be at first, how was it that fertility was, apparently, so common in the children? And why was the idea so forcefully shut down, eventually leading to the alteration of Mitsuru and Kokoro's memories? I'm not going to question where the children came from, as I'm sure that egg and sperm cells were likely preserved once infertility took hold, but the anime does not explicitly state this, which is where it loses a few more points. There's a lot of focus on mental health because of this, but it's not something acknowledged by the adults. Just look at how Nana begins to regress towards the end of the anime and how she tries to comfort the child, clearly in discomfort and crying. She was sympathetic because she had emotion, yes, but the toll that the fights against the Klaxosaurs took, and the lack of moral support after Verm left the Earth in dismay, took a toll on everyone. Look at Hiro and how he failed in his role to support his fellow squad members, squarely focused on Zero Two. This is where I want to bring up the book, The Prince and the Beast. This book symbolized everything that Zero Two wanted to be, and that created a desire in her to find her prince. Notice how she refused to part with the book, even as she had grown up. This becomes a representation of Zero Two as a whole and the embodiment of her desires. Think about how her separation from Hiro caused her unsought pain and sorrow and sometimes even anger. The culmination of everyone's desire to live a life of happiness and find a way to become self-sufficient was a daunting task for children who'd never even made their own meals before. See how the attitude of the anime changed after the Nines were bedridden, but also think about how their own selfish desires to keep the status quo hurt them in the end. While their insistence in space, fighting against Verm, was welcome, it wasn't so much for the benefit of Hiro and the others as it was their own internal desire to keep fighting until death. The same stubbornness that plagues Zero too. The warming of relations is a good thing, especially when it comes to Squad 13 and their attitude towards Hiro, but at the same time, he begins to neglect his fellow squad mates all to chase a girl who loves him so much she leaves him behind on Earth to live his own life, as normally as he can. I can't exactly fault Zero Two for making such a rash decision considering how Hiro's ingestion of her blood changed him, but I feel she should have at least taken responsibility and told him where she was going. Regardless, this becomes another reflection of the changing mental health of everyone. The final themes I want to mention and things to take into consideration I won't spend as much time on, but they range from the importance of name, my darling gave this name to me, to inhumanity. Think about how Hiro gave everyone a name and the importance those names had to the ones who held them. Think about Futoshi's desire to be with Kokoro and how they ultimately ended up with different partners entirely. What did Kokoro see in Mitsuru? Why the pushback on having children? Think about how their lust for each other turned into something that can only be described as a forbidden love. Finally, the very castles these children, and even the adults, had built were only sand. Insecure and faulty, but were ultimately the destinies they chose. Who cares if things started off a little shaky? Was Zero Two's desire to be human and her rejection of her own inhumanity what sparked the winds of change in Plantation 13? But what does that make Hiro, and is the ending of this anime an acceptance of that? Of who you really are? To conclude these 12 pages of analyses and review, I'll start by saying the whole idea of space was rushed in the way they implemented it. Verm was a cool concept and a great plot twist, but it was just too sudden and lacked the necessary seeds to grow into something that wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. This truly felt like someone said, Hey, what do you think about the idea of space? Now, the way the children eventually grew up to become self-sufficient and their new start was really wholesome. It was quick, though, and we really needed to see more of this and not just fades where it went from Plantation 13 to an entire city in 10 minutes. The idea is there and it tries to be the polar opposite of how things began. I like that. 
from dependency to independency. There are many themes throughout the anime that, without a rewatch and careful attention, will get missed. Hence why the anime community doesn't hold Darling and the Franks in high regard. Most people don't actually go back and think. In some ways, that's kind of my job, I guess, except I don't get paid for it. But you can bring me one step closer by subscribing. Still though, there was good progression of emotion and an enormous amount of character dynamic and growth. If anything, this anime should be commended for trying something that the genres of science, fantasy, and fiction don't oftentimes try, much less to the extent of trying to merge three worlds into one. Ultimately, however, this is where Darling and the Franks loses the most points. Where it was introduced far too late and the benevolence of the Klaxosaurus seems like too much of a given. It's not perfect, but it's certainly not bad. I think at best, Darling and the Franks can pull an easy 8. A 7.5 may be more reasonable, however, as previously stated in many of the above points, there are many reasons this anime gains and loses points. After having watched the anime from start to finish and having a much greater analytical perspective on it, it's truly a masterpiece. Not in terms of storytelling or its ending, but in terms of the complexity of the characters and the interpersonal relationships that make up the basis for many of the anime's major decisions. It's easy to forget the story's main protagonists were children, some even clones. It's hard to be too critical when you realize just how incredibly a job these children did, facing adversity and finding a way forward. Four years ago, I gave this anime a 10, and I think a lot of that was because of the ending, and I mean the very end. Will I update my score? Probably not, since it offers a window back into what my thoughts were like the first time, and who doesn't like to reminisce on easier times every once in a while? But for one final score, I would personally give this anime an 8.1. Not quite an 8, but something that nudges it over just enough to make a difference. Much of that final push comes from the fact that the anime frequently drives home the idea of perseverance, but also the strong bonds it creates between characters. Remember, we aren't always right, and sometimes we do have to apologize. Darling in the Franks is a perfect example of just that. High strong emotion, fear, loneliness, love, anger, even confusion when an unexpected answer is received. As one final note, I would highly recommend this anime to those who had mixed feelings about it during their initial watch. It's not really suited for those who are new to anime, but it's not a bad pickup either. I'd also highly recommend a rewatch. If you're trying to compare it to something else, you'll always be let down because Darling in the Franks is unique and tries something that really hasn't been done before. While it may share similarities to Gurren Logon in places, that does not necessarily mean it's a carpet copy, nor that it fails at what it's trying to achieve, and that I believe is finding understanding in each other and not treating others like monsters, regardless of what they may look like. Never giving up on someone you love and keeping a promise made. These two themes I feel represent the genre, that flightless bird. It's unable to fly with only one wing, but with two, it can sort of heights it never even imagined.